Okay, everyone, welcome. It's a great pleasure to welcome here today Professor Justin Miller Schultz, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at California State University of Sacramento. And I want to preface this introduction by saying that, you know, it's my firm belief that the role of the analytical chemist is just increasingly important. Uh, we need to know what chemicals are entering our environment, what we're being exposed to, what uh, organisms in, in our ecological systems are being exposed to, and understanding how they change. And these are the sorts of things that Justin works on. How do we tell what's out there? What should we be measuring? And what chemicals could be useful as markers of a large suite of pollutants that we can't possibly foresee uh, measuring? And so, um, in a lot of ways, Justin is a detective, uh, figuring out what's out there in our environment and using the best analytical approaches to do that. Um, he is um, a UC alum. He got his bachelor's from, in environmental chemistry from UC San Diego. And then his PhD is in analytical chemistry from University of Washington in Seattle. And we had a very interesting discussion today about his PhD, his dissertation research. He was studying a specific compound that's emitted with, uh, from diesel exhaust called 1-nitropyrene. And it turns out that you, know, you can measure, which he did, how much people are inhaling associated with particles and then how it's metabolized and what you know, these transformation products are that, that are within the, the urine of individuals sort of as a tracer of their exposure. It's a really detailed, tough, and important analytical uh, chemistry applied to pollutants that have, can have a profound impact on, on people's health. Uh, Justin uh, worked as a postdoctoral researcher um, at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then also he transitioned away from a little bit away from air pollutants to water pollutants, working at the Center for Urban Waters as a postdoc at University of Washington in Tacoma. And what led us to talk about um, you know, his research when we were having conversations about his research was really this very recent paper that, that captured my interest on looking at emerging contaminants as tracers of wastewater from on-site wastewater treatment systems, which he recently published in Water Research in 2016. So uh, Justin teaches courses in quantitative chemical analysis, which is really great. He's going to create the next generation of people who are going to carry on with this work, and um, we should all be grateful for that. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Justin Miller Schultz, who will talk to us about chemical tracers uh, in the environment. Great. Well, thank, thanks, Trish, for that great uh, introduction. It's really um, it's great to be here. Uh, I've had uh, some really interesting conversations this morning. Um, looking forward to more of those. And so I'm excited to talk about some of the things that I've been working on. Um, Trish mentioned a lot of those things. Um, but, but the general idea is um, we impact our environment with the things that we uh, do, whether it's drive a car or um, flush a toilet or water our lawns. And so um, there are chemicals that are probably inherent with each of those processes. And so what my interest is in, is in um, developing methodology to measure those things quantitatively, right? Um, so the types of things that we might want to measure, um, in water, these are things like bacterial pollution, oh, sorry, bacterial pollution or, um, or nutrient pollution. And, and this is, these are things like, uh, that can lead to uh, harmful algal blooms, right? Or we might be interested in a specific type of metal or organic uh, chemical contamination, right? So we've got some figures here, right? And we've got these areas that are um, you're not allowed to swim in, right, because of E. coli pollution or um, these, these harmful algal blooms, right? This poor duck is completely cut, coated with uh, algae. And then um, Trish talked about how you know, my thesis research and, and some, a little bit of the work that I do now is on uh, atmospheric uh, pollution. and so. These are things like particulate matter, uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, um, ozone. Um, so, so there's kind of a, a wide variety of ways that we can release things that are, that are um, having an impact on the environment. And, and what the idea is is that each of these um, types of pollution may have a specific set of chemicals that are associated with them. So some necessary characteristics of chemical tracers, right? What do we need to have a chemical tracer that's going to work? Um, well, we have to be able to measure it, right? Um, so typically we use things like uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry to do this. Um, and, and as our analytical 
capability gets better and better, this gets, this yardstick moves, right? And we can measure lower and lower amounts. Um, the tracer really should be specific to a particular process or source. If it's not specific to one source, then it's not as great as a, as a tracer, right? So um, if this beach is contaminated by bacteria, you want to know, there's a vest, people have a vested interest in knowing which is the source. Is it human wastewater or is it these, these dairy cattle, right? And, um, and there's, a, there's a financial ramification in addition to kind of us just wanting to know who's responsible for these problems, right? There's a financial ramification to, you know, cleaning up the municipal wastewater treatment plant or for this farmer to have to in, uh, install different ways to keep that waste out of the, the waterway or to treat it before it gets there. And then these, these tracers need to be conserved from source to receptor, right? So if, if something is emitted from a particular source but then is reacted away or volatilizes or something, um, to, to remove it from the environmental system, then it's not really as great of a tracer, at least to the extent that you don't know exactly how that, how that, um, that reaction is happening, right? So, so when the, the, the tracer is released from this outfall pipe, then it needs to stay around for long enough for then my students to go and collect a water sample that has it in there, right? Um, so how do we choose these chemical tracers, right? We can, we can use knowledge of chemical composition, of the chemical composition of the emission at the source, right? So we can effectively sample right at the smokestack, right? And, and figure out what is in that, that emission. Or we can make measurements at a site that we feel is likely to be impacted by the specific source and kind of work backwards. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, an application of, of this. Um, but, but they're not necessarily the same thing, right? Um, and this is um, a couple pictures from, from one of my postdocs uh, at University of Wisconsin at Madison. These are, I wasn't involved in this research, but um, the point of this is just to show that they were interested in looking at some tracers of meat cooking, which, um, and uh, chemical tracers of meat cooking for air pollution, right? And I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about some of that a little bit later. But to do that, they, they kind of grilled a hamburger, right? And then diluted that exhaust in this, you know, kind of crazy contraption here and, and pulled all sorts of different samples, right? Gas phase samples, fine particulate, um, total suspended particulate, and, and collected all these in uh, measuring the flow rate and um, to be able to get a specific concentration. So figuring out what the chemical composition of a specific source is is not, not a trivial exercise, right? There's, this is a pretty complicated piece of equipment. And you could do the same thing with, with kind of if you're interested in the emissions of this minivan. Um, so kind of thinking about human wastewater, right, what are some potential tracers of, of these compounds and just in terms of speculating, right? Well, caffeine metabolites, right? I mean, a lot of the work that I did was in uh, the Seattle area, right? So we're, we're drinking a lot of coffee up there. Um, I'm sure on any co college campus, right, this is kind of a, uh, would be a good tracer. Um, and then things like sucralose, which is an artificial sweetener. There's some antibiotics, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Um, and then non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, right? So these are things that we use all the time. We excrete them into the wastewater um, stream and then um, they persist to differing extents through that process. Um, so talking a little bit more specifically about sucralose, this is kind of a pretty popular one now and it's a low calorie sweetener. So it's a, a sucrose molecule where chlorines have been um, repla uh, used to replace the hydrogens. And so what this does, this stuff is much, much sweeter than actual sugar, um, but we also don't metabolize it very well. And so we like that it tastes sweet, but we don't get any calories from it, right? So um, the other thing is that it undergoes little to no degradation in municipal wastewater treatment plant processes. And so it's what we'd call a conservative tracer, right? And this is kind of in contra uh, contradiction to caffeine, which is also, uh, or, which is ubiquitous, but is pretty well removed by wastewater treatment plant processes, right? So there's a differential um, removal efficiency. Um, this group of sulfonamide antibiotics is nice because um, there are some widely used uh, antibiotics like sulfamethoxazole, uh, also sulfamethazole and, and um, dimethoxine and thiazole are, are much more rarely used for humans, but they're more extensively used for animals. And so if you can, you know, from a measurement perspective, if you're good at measuring 
one of these sulfonamide antibiotics, you're likely going to be able to measure multiple compounds of the same kind of chemical character with the same chemical characteristics. And so this can give you a nice um, differentiation between the two the two sources, right? And for for chemists, right? The the substituent group here, this is the sulfonamide. Uh, constituent, and then this constituent group here dictates if this is sulfamethoxazole or methazole or thiazole. Um, another compound is uh, talked about was trimethoprim, right? And this is frequently used in combination of, uh, with sulfamethoxazole to treat a variety of bacterial infections. Um, it's a pretty widely used uh, compound. Um, and then some, some kind of not necessarily human wastewater tracers, but, but more runoff tracers or stormwater would be these triazine pesticides, right? So atrazine is one of the most widely used pesticides in the U.S. Um, for uh, corn and uh, sugarcane. Uh, simazine is used for a little bit different types of um, plants. But again, in the same vein, if you can measure one of these, you can probably measure multiple of them pretty, pretty well. So we've been working on methodology to measure a suite of these different compounds. Um, so I want to kind of just talk a little bit about what the general process into making these measurements is. Um, first, we collect a sample, right? Um, we filter the sample to remove particulates, and, and hopefully this is to eliminate the biological growth, and if, which can lead to subsequent degradation of the tracers in between sample collection and when you get to analyze them in the lab, right? Even if that's a, a short, you know, 24-hour or 48-hour type period. Um, we do an extraction and concentration to remove interferences and remove, um, increase the concentration. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then some sort of, sort of chemical analysis. So usually we're separating the compounds that we're interested in with chromatography and then um, figuring out which of those are present uh, by mass spectrometry. And then we're going to take that data and do a lot of quality assurance, quality control, especially with things like caffeine. Um, since it's so ubiquitous, Laboratory contamination is a big problem, right? And so we, you know, using things like laboratory blanks and field blanks to, to make sure that what we're seeing is, is really out there in the environment is a, is a critical step. Um, so to put some kind of pictures to those steps, um, we'd go and we'd collect a sample. Um, we would spike with isotopically labeled recovery surrogates after we got the sample back to the lab. And this is to, we're going to take the sample through kind of a, a long process. And so using chemicals that are basically chemically the same, but differ by mass units, can help us figure out how much of those chemicals we're losing in the process. And so this is a pretty critical step in terms of figuring out what the exact concentration of the, the compound is in, in the water sample. Um, and then, again, this filtration to remove the uh, biological material. This is kind of how the filtration works. We pump the sample through um, here and through a, a, a big uh, filter about that big and, and then catch the, the um, dissolved phase. Um, we do an extraction with solid phase extraction, right, where we concentrate, hopefully, all of our analytes onto this chemical uh, resin, and then we then elute those uh, chemicals that we're interested in with organic solvent. Um, from here, we then re reduce the volume, and then we can do, add our um, a separate set of uh, isotopically labeled internal standards, and then analyze with gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, or liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. And, and this step here, this reduction in organic uh, uh, solvent volume is, is critical um, because we need to basically go from a volume of 1,000 mils for an 1,000 mil water sample to a volume of a liter or a milliliter, right? So this is a 1,000-fold concentration factor. So, you know, frequently my students will ask me, well, why do we need to do this, right? It's, it's kind of a, it, it takes a long time. Um, but even with these kind of sensitive instrumentation uh, techniques that we have, like GCMS or LCMS, you need this concentration factor to, to be able to see the samples, uh, see the analytes in the samples, right? They're just present at too low a concentration, nanogram per liter frequently in the environment. So typically, that whole long process takes uh, a well-trained undergraduate or graduate student um, about two days, day and a half or two days, to do 20 samples. Right? So it's, it's kind of, it takes a long time to get, get that uh, data for those 20 samples, and, and a decent chunk of those are field blank and spike type samples anyway. So the last thing I want to say kind of about methodology is just to talk about limits of detection, right? I mean, I think um, in the literature there's a lot of, um, there's, there's papers that are published where they say, well, you know, we saw this here, and so it's definitely impacted by wastewater or agricultural runoff, right? And, 
this limited detection is really a function of how clean your lab is, the instrumental sensitivity and the methodological precision. So to really just saying the tracer is there is not necessarily the whole story, right? And I kind of use this um, graph to communicate that, right? So we have this chemical X, who knows what's a, what it's a tracer of, right? And, um, and we've got these six data points over a span of a year or half of a year, right? So if our limited detection was five nanograms per liter, then we'd only be, see, we'd be seeing it two-thirds of the time. But if our detection limit was 10 nanograms per liter, we'd see it a third of the time. And if it was 18 nanograms per liter, we wouldn't see it at all, right? But the tracer's there at the same concentration no matter what. So depending on how good your, your laboratory process is may mean that you think that it's never there and so it's not being impacted, but maybe it is, or that it's always there so everything's impacted when maybe it's not, right? So, so this, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's some nuance to the detection limit or detection frequency uh, statistic. So I want to talk about some data that, that um, we have in terms of, uh, in terms of these, which of these tracers are, are going to be uh, possibly useful, right? So we had some 24-hour uh, composite samples for influent and effluent um, from our we regional wastewater treatment plant. And what we found is these are these uh, sulfonamide antibiotics that are, that are less widely prescribed, right, or, or used for animals. And so for a municipal wastewater treatment plant, we would assume that we wouldn't see them and, and we're not seeing them in the influent or the effluent. Um, same thing with these um, triazine pesticides, right. But these kind of widely used uh, antibiotics, sulfur methoxazole and trimethoprim, we're seeing at a, at a much uh, higher level, obviously. And um, so we've got a variety of influent samples. These are just different dilutions and then uh, effluent samples. So kind of the, the striking thing here is that we've got a pretty decent removal, uh, but probably about 75% between the influent and the effluent. Um, and we're really not seeing that amount of removal for the trimethoprim. So from a tracer perspective, right, this means that, that if you're, possibly if you're seeing both of these at the same concentration, you might assume that that might be an effluent, uh, more of an effluent signal, whereas if you're seeing much more sulfur methoxazole than trimethoprim, you might see that that's a, um, in more of an influent signal. This is a, a pretty small suite of compounds, and so it's not a whole story, but that's kind of the general uh, idea, right? Um, this is some previously published data that uh, from a group in Switzerland that's, that's just uh, kind of a little bit uh, prettier than some of the charts that, that I have, right, showing sucralose, this really well-conserved tracer, uh, incoming to these wastewater treatment plants at the low microgram per liter range, and the outgoing concentration being about the same. So it's just not removed. The sucralose just isn't removed by wastewater treatment. And, and data that, that I have from uh, Western Washington treatment plants kind of shows a similar kind of thing. Um, and again, uh, another paper from this group in Switzerland um, showing almost complete removal of caffeine, um, 99, I think I've lost it, yeah, 99% to 90%, uh, or one at a little bit lower, 81% elimination. Um, so uh, the, the other thing I did want to mention here is that even though it's very well removed in wastewater treatment, 99% is not complete, right? there's still a lot of stuff left because uh, the concentration is high coming in, right? So 99%, um, removing 99% of 10 micrograms per liter still leaves you with 100 nanograms per liter, which you should, uh, should be able to measure. So um, I kind of, what I'm trying to uh, communicate is, is that the relative abundances of these tracers, I think, is, is really what's most important. Um, so, as kind of a case study for this, I want to talk about the, the paper that uh, Trish mentioned, um, where we looked at uh, on-site septic systems in uh, western Washington state. So these septic systems, on-site septics, are a pretty large component of wastewater treatment in the U.S., right, about uh, 25%. Um, and really common in remote or rural location where uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that would need to happen to connect a small amount of homes to a big wastewater treatment plant. Um, so in partnership with this uh, county public health department, we repeatedly monitored beach seeps where the ground and groundwater outfalls that are, were um, impacted by these uh, uh, septic tanks. And an important part of the study is that we knew that some of these tanks weren't functioning correctly, right? So we knew that they were bad. So uh, 
um, that gave us a great, um, a great case study for, for evaluating these, these uh, tracer ideas. Um, so this is an example of one of those sites that we knew wasn't functioning well, and we took um, repeated uh, grab samples over about a half of a year from, from that. So we've got the stack concentration of these different tracers on the y-axis here, and then the fecal coliform concentration on the x-axis, and that's the, the fecal coliform is the dots. Um, so you can see, I mean, a couple things are kind of immediately obvious. One is that there's kind of a lot of variability in both the tracer concentrations and the fecal uh, levels, right? Um, and the other thing is which, uh, which compounds are pretty common, right? Sucralose um, in a couple of these, um, acetaminophen uh, in, in some of the, as the bottom bar, and, and ibuprofen kind of in the middle. Um, and then this septic tank gets repaired, right? So they weren't gonna let um, this home kind of continue to not fix its septic tank just so we could do this study, unfortunately. So they fix this thing, and then um, you can see that pretty immediately, even though there is all this variability, um, this, the fecal coliform levels really dropped off, and so did the, the tracer levels, right? So, so that kind of fits into this idea of the tracers being well correlated with the fecal indicator bacteria. So then this is a second set where we, or a second site where we knew that the site was impacted by um, the failing septic system. And you see a similar kind of amount of variability, a, a lot more consistent presence of sucralose um, and as well as uh, ibuprofen, uh, at least for the first three. Um, and then when the system was corrected, we get a little bit of a different story, right? So the sucralose levels pretty much stay the same. The fecal coliform, you know, is definitely lower than these two, right? But, but about the same as, as these. And, and right here, at least, there's really no difference between this, this profile, right, and, and kind of the average of these other ones, right? At this point, um, we've definitely got, it's mostly sucralose here. And so this site was likely more, more likely than not impacted by multiple different septic systems, not just the one that was corrected. And so there's the possibility that, that some of these, as well as these, are profiles from multiple septic influ influences of the same site, right? So you really have to know what the site is that you're monitoring if you're doing these um, measurements at, at kind of the end of the line situation instead of right at the outfall of the septic tank itself, right? Um, so we kind of did correlation analysis for, um, for these, all these sites that we knew were uh, impacted by septic systems. And we found, you know, our, our thought is that the tracers that track with fecal coliform are gonna be the ones that we anticipate being quote unquote good tracers. So things that we felt like were useful were caffeine and the metabolites of caffeine, uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen, and then compounds that aren't useful, uh, sucralose and sulfamethoxazole, so these are these um, what very well conserved tracers, right? Things that aren't really eliminated to a large extent in wastewater treatment, um, as well as carbamazepine, which I didn't talk about but uh, previously, but it's an anti-epileptic drug that also isn't very well removed by wastewater treatment. Um, and this is kind of the, the uh, correlation matrix just for fecal coliform and all of our different, um, all of our different potential tracers, right? So, the ones that we feel like are, are good tracers are, are strongly positively correlated, um, and, and the ones that aren't um, are, 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 don't show a, a significant positive correlation. Um, so I want to talk about, as well, what happens to these things once they get out into the environment, right? Um, because it's, it's pretty un, uh, uncommon that you're going to be able to make these measurements right at the, the uh, site that's impacted only by that failing septic. So, so we we're asking kind of, do the tracers degrade or partition to solids, and really what's the relationship between, uh, for, um, between the tracers uh, as, as a group, right? So one of the other studies that we did that we're kind of working on um, getting uh, published is to, that we measured the suite of chemical tracers in, in a couple different dimensions, in space, right? So um, where we took a lot of samples from a relatively short time period. Um, this is up in uh, Washington State, so there's where we were, right, and there's the Puget Sound. 
And then we also measured at the same location over a year, right, to look at spatial versus temporal variability. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to show a lot of data from that, but, but I just wanted to talk about this relationship between sulfur methoxazole and sucralose. So these are these two well-conserved um, wastewater tracers, right? And so these are total concentrations of particulate and dissolved, right? So in this case, we see a pretty good correlation between sucralose on the x-axis and, and uh, sulfur methoxazole on the y-axis. And, you know, if, if they're conservative and come from similar processes and are degraded about to the same extent, we, this is kind of what we'd expect to see. But when we look at the time-based monitoring, so we're in the same location, we're monitoring over, a, um, over a, a period of a year, we don't see that same positive relationship. Um, these are dissolved only concentrations. We didn't have particulate phase data for this. So that is, is one possibility. If there's differential partitioning to the solids and we're only measuring the liquid phase here, maybe that's why we're not seeing this, this, um, this strong positive relationship. Um, the other option, right, is, is that there's an influence of one source as compared with the other, but, but both of these should really be from the same human wastewater source, right? And, um, so, so it is kind of a, uh, a mystery. And the, the log KOWs, neither of these are, would you, you would say, are, are very hydrophobic, right? Both of them are, um, although sulfur methoxazole is more, more hydrophobic than sucralose. Um, so kind of to, to talk about these traces of wastewater, we know that these um, wastewater treatment plant processes eliminate some tracers to a large extent like caffeine. Um, but but other tracers could be good uh, work for wastewater treatment plant effluent. Um, and we know from our KITSEP study that certain, certain compounds like caffeine and its metabolites, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, may work on a smaller scale. But one thing that's, I think, really important is this idea of, of sewer shed, right? So we talk about a watershed as, as all the things that feed into a particular um, river. Uh, in, in terms of sewer shed, all the things that feed into that particular wastewater treatment plant process are going to have an effect on what comes out. And so the thing with these septic systems is that they're little wastewater treatment plants, but they're treatment plants for one home, right? And so um, with things like caffeine and sucralose, ibuprofen, we kind of assume that most people are, are taking one or some of these things at, at any one time, right? But uh, uh, something like sulfur methoxazole, hopefully that's not a daily you know, something that, that the, is being taken daily in the house. And so these lesser used things, um, things that are rarely used, at least in comparison with caffeine or sucralose, may not be good tracers at that septic tank scale. Right? Um, so I wanted to talk now about some of the projects that, that I'm working on uh, at Sacramento State. You know, I'm continually working on this, this antibiotics, food additives, and um, uh, prop uh, runoff tracers, um, and that was the kind of stuff that I talked about with the wastewater treatment plant sampling. Um, and then also a separate method for non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, caffeine and sucralose. Um, two other things working on are uh, using polycyclic aromatics, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons as tracers of municipal stormwater, and then also these heterocyclic aromatic amines as tracers of, of um, meat cooking. Um, and one thing that has that this and this has in common is this this adaption of analytical methodology using chemical derivatization. So, um, so frequently, particularly in water, many of the chemicals that we're interested in measuring are, are polar and non-volatile. Which, for an analytical chemist, if I want to use GCMS, I'm not going to be able to use it for these kind of compounds because it's hard to get them into the gas phase. Or if you're able to get them into the gas phase, you destroy them. Um, so to analyze these things by GCMS, we need to do a chemical derivatization, which means that we take our, our tracer with this kind of what we call an active hydrogen, a hydrogen that we can replace, and we replace it with this R um, silicon group, right? So this, this, these Rs are typically uh, a methyl group, CH3, for example, that makes them nonpolar. So then we derivatize our chemical so that it's now Y bonded to the silicon and, and three methyl groups, for example. So this removes the ability of it to hydrogen bond and um, makes it able for us to analyze by, by GCMS. Um, 
So these heterocyclic aromatic amines are kind of interesting. They're, they're formed by the pyrolysis of amino acids in this, this Maillard reaction. Um, and they're carcinogenic and mutagenic. And their prevalence is kind of unknown in uh, ambient particulate matter. There's just not a lot of data out there. Um, but the emissions of cooking meat may be a major source. And different of these compounds may be enriched in different meat types. So hamburger, grilled hamburger might have different amounts than grilled chicken, for example. And then also, um, they might have higher concentrations in the food. So that's where a lot of the work that's been done is, exists, is, is what's happening in the food. So what's your exposure if you eat a hamburger, rather than if you're cooking a hamburger, for example. So this MEIQX, which saves me from having to say this whole thing, um, may be in higher concentrations in the food itself, and the A-alpha-C may be enriched in the emissions. And so from a derivatization perspective, we're, we're replacing one of these hydrogens with this um, with this methylated solyl group so that we can use uh, GCMS to look at these. So we have uh, parts of these samples from uh, one in three uh, fine particulate uh, samples from Bakersfield and Fresno. And so we're going to look at the relationships between these HAAs and existing chemical fingerprints for, for meat. And this is um, one of these just kind of interesting, I think, these uh, air sampling sites. They have a lot of researchers. That, that have little spots. This is just a dentist's office in downtown Fresno that, um, where all this stuff is. And I guess I'm, I'm there for scale. So these things are uh, you know, big sampling platforms. They're like six feet. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an interesting. And this is only like half of the roof. Um, so another thing that I talked about was this uh, human wastewater uh, markers and derivatization. So these are our structures of the things that we kind of identified in the um, in the Kitsap work as being, you know, maybe good tracers like ibuprofen or acetaminophen are, are not as good like sucralose for the septic tank scale. And so being able to derivatize these, um, getting rid of these hydrogens here makes them able to, for us to look at them with, with GCMS. And so one of the ideas is that a more universally acceptable method, uh, meaning that a lot of labs have GCMS and not nearly as many have LCMS. So a, a lab, uh, a method that that more labs have access to would, would help us build up the data set and we can look at more of these things. So one of the things we're going to do with that is um, we're partnering with the USGS lab on campus. to um, They're doing a, a large scale uh, study in Sacramento to uh, the Sacramento area to look at 50 to 70 of these domestic wells to look at groundwater age and, and water quality in general. Um, so they're going to uh, look at all these different uh, contaminants or, or, or compounds, not, not necessarily contaminants, um, and, and we're going to look at the artificial sweeteners and some of these other um, markers. So a big part of the, the power here, right, is to, is to use the, the chemical measurements that we're making in combination with all this other stuff and, and come up with some sort of relationship between all these things. Um, and then the, the, the kind of last thing I wanted to talk about was, was using polycyclic aromatics as, as combustion uh, traces of combustion and, and storm, in, in stormwater. So these PAHs are classified as, as two or more aromatic rings fused together. So this is an example of naphthalene. It's just two benzene rings fused together. And um, they're present in petroleum-based fuels. So crude oil, uh, gasoline, diesel, and, as, and the carbon-based um, fuel emissions. Okay? So basically, different fuels contain different PAHs. And we kind of separate these between pHs that are petrogenic, meaning b before combustion or, or kind of oil spills, or after combustion, so pyrogenic. And these are just pictures of all these different things that could give you pHs, right? So wood combustion or automobile combustion. A big source of pHs in the Puget Sound region is the creosote that they use to coat um, railroad pilings or, or telephone poles. And so this, this kind of slowly seeps off into the, um, into the water. So, because these different PA, uh, emissions are enriched in specific pHs, then we potentially have a source uh, pattern for, for different types of combustion. So this is a um, thesis from uh, this guy O'Malley uh, a while ago. But uh, it talks about how these fire soots are enriched in these heavier pHs, whereas car soots, uh, emissions from cars are more evenly distributed. The, the two rings are the lightest pHs, and the, and the five rings are the heaviest pHs. 
outboard motor condensate is more um, uh, of a lighter signature, and then crude oil, the unburned pHs, we really don't see many of the um, heavier polycyclic aromatics. So Sacramento State has um, installed some of these low impact device, uh, impact development devices, right? So this is a kind of a bioinfiltration planner where the stormwater comes in to the, um, into the device, right? So this is through a, a cut in the curb and then um, pools here and then infiltrates through this uh, bioremediation uh, media and there's plants in here. Right? So, and then this is where the, the water then comes out. Um, so, so last winter, uh, the winter before, 2014, 2015, um, this group on campus, the Office of Water Programs, installed a bunch of these things across campus. And then um, last winter, they collected uh, samples from these storm events and for metals and uh, pesticides analysis. And then they, they um, graciously provided our lab with some samples to look at polycyclic aromatics. So this is kind of a map of the campus. Um, this, uh, it's not oriented north, right? This, this way is north. Uh, so the parking lots that were sampled is lot seven and, and lot 10 on the south, southeast end of uh, campus. And so the samples were collected throughout the storm. So they're time-weighted composites. So about every hour that it was raining, um, they, they collected a, a sample. So I just want to talk about some of the results. I don't have all of them. Um, but we really saw highest concentrations for fluorinthine and chrysine. So all the different pHs are on the x-axis here. The heavier ones are at this end. And then I also plotted some of the um, metals data here. Right? So lightest pH is here and, and heaviest pH is here. So we did see some reduction in, in um, between what was coming into the device and the overflow. And I guess I, I didn't have that slide in here. So there's what is coming into the device what comes out of the device, and then what is flowing too quickly to, um, to be absorbed by the device. And so we really actually, actually, they weren't able to collect any effluent samples, meaning that no water was coming out of the device. It was either taking too long to infiltrate, um, or it was raining too fast, uh, too hard, and so the, the flow was just coming over the device and, 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 and uh, going away as overflow. And so what's plotted here is the hash bars are influent and then the, the orange bars are overflow. And so you can kind of see the general trend is that the, um, that the concentrations are, are much higher in the influent with the exception of this one uh, anthracene here. Um, but the, the pattern is kind of the same. So there's kind of a, a hump here for these uh, lighter three ringed pHs and then another hump here for these uh, four ringed pHs. And then this is a bunch, uh, a the different lots, so lot seven, and then there's a couple devices in lot 10. And what we're kind of seeing is a similar kind of pattern, but a big difference in relative concentration, or um, similar kind of pattern, but big difference in absolute concentrations, right? And, and that's kind of gets back to this idea of the, of the fingerprint, right? Is that even if the, the absolute concentration changes, the relative ratios of the, of the different pollutants or different traces should, should be pretty similar. Um, so we have uh, a lot more work to do here. There was uh, seven storm events, and that was only data for, for one event. So um, we're still do working on the chemical and data analysis. Um, and, and like I said, we're going to do correlation with, with all these other uh, analytes, uh, metals and pesticides um, as well. And then you know, future work here would be correlation of that analyte suite with, with the parameters that we're, we're kind of trying to trace, right? So this is all chemical data, right? We're not talking about indicator bacteria or nutrient levels. And so getting that data and seeing how those relate, or, or that's the, the kind of next step. Um, the one other thing was, was to add additional tracers, like these uh, benzothiazole amines as, as tire wear markers. But, but that's kind of all um, kind of down the line. So um, kind of wanted to wrap up just by kind of stepping back and, and kind of thinking about the chemical tracers that they have the potential to inf uh, inf uh, inform us on the anthropogenic impacts um, at a site of in interest. But the utility of these tracers is really a function of how they vary with what we're interested in tracking, as well as, at, and this is really that question of, does the tracer concentration increase as the impact gets worse, right? Um, things like sucralose that are really uh, well conserved, they might not associate 
uh, with indicator bacteria because they're present no matter if the septic tank is working well or if it's not. Whereas something like uh, caffeine may be only present if it's not working very well. And then the tracer concentrations or the relationships between the concentrations can be informative as opposed to just the concentration of a single tracer, right? So I think that's really the, the main point is that you really need a variety of things to, to talk about human wastewater or a variety of things to talk about stormwater. Using one is, is not going to um, give you much information about that, that specific source. Okay. So um, with that, I just want to make a few acknowledgments and, and mainly just to talk about that all that sample processing as, as I you know, get students, I don't have to do it as much anymore. And so um, I'm really thankful for the, the students that spend all the time processing all the data because it would take me a long time. So um, yeah, and with that, I'll.